Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be looking at hydrostatics with constant acceleration and constant rotation. Now, it may seem a little odd to be talking about hydrostatics when we have acceleration and rotation, but we can actually use the same methodologies from hydrostatics to look at these two specific cases. And specifically, what we're looking at is pressure variation in these two scenarios. We're going to be looking at a differential fluid element again, but for the case of constant acceleration, we're going to say that this has an acceleration in the x direction and in the y direction. As always, we have to deal with the force of gravity and the pressure on these four surfaces. And then I'm going to label some of the geometry so that we can reference it later. So these are surfaces 1, 2, 3, and 4. The width is going to be delta x, the height delta y, and the depth is going to be delta z into the page. So just as with the original pressure variation video, we're going to be looking at the sum of the forces, but this time, instead of these being 0, they have to be equal to mass times acceleration. So we'll split this into some of the forces in the x and some of the forces in the y. x is going to have the same forces as before, just the pressure on the left-hand side multiplied by the area of phase 2 minus the pressure on the right-hand side, which increased by dp dx delta x, and that's all going to be multiplied by the area of phase 4. And all of this together is going to be equal to our mass, which is delta m multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. Now this a2 and a4 are both equal to delta y delta z. This delta m is equal to our density multiplied by the volume of the box. So right away, we can get rid of the pressure for side 2 and the pressure for side 4 and also divide through by this delta y delta z on both sides of the equation. So taking all of those steps into account, we end up with a negative dp dx multiplied by delta x. That's going to be equal to this rho delta x multiplied by the acceleration in the x direction. So after dividing through by delta x and moving the negative to the right-hand side, we end up with the derivative of pressure in x, which is just equal to negative rho times a x. So that's all we can do in the x direction. Let's look at y. The sum of the forces in the y direction is going to look pretty similar. So we have pressure multiplied by a1 minus the pressure plus the change in pressure in the y direction multiplied by delta y all of that multiplied by the area of surface 3. And then we have to deal with the force of gravity, which is going to be a negative delta m multiplied by g. And all of that together is going to be equal to our mass multiplied by acceleration in the y direction. So just like before, we get rid of these pressures. This area is equal to delta x delta z. So getting rid of the delta y, delta x, delta z turns these masses into just rho by itself. And so what we end up with is a negative dp dy is equal to, and we can move this rho g to the right hand side and end up with rho multiplied by g plus the acceleration in the y direction. And then if all that's left is moving the negative sign over, so we end up with dp dy is equal to negative rho multiplied by g plus a y. And this takes care of the y direction. So now what we'll do is we'll take these two equations and integrate both of them. So integrating this rho a x gives us p is equal to negative rho times a x multiplied by x. And normally we'd say that we have a constant that we add into that, but this can actually be a function of y. So the function of y that we can add in is just the integral of this with respect to y. So we also subtract off this rho g plus a y multiplied by y. 
we've taken care of any contributions that have a function of x and any contributions that have a function of y, so everything else can only be a constant. So for acceleration in any direction, our pressure is going to vary linearly in x and linearly in y. This is as far as we're going for constant acceleration. So now let's switch gears and look at constant rotation. The situation here is that we have maybe some drum or some circular surface that is enclosing some water. And this drum is going to rotate. And then after some time, uh, the friction of the wall is going to cause the water to start rotating with it. The end result of this is that the entire thing is going to be moving as a rigid body. In that situation, we know what the acceleration is going to be. The acceleration is going to be solely in the r direction, which means it's pointing from the center, and it's going to have a value of negative omega squared r. The negative means that the acceleration is actually pointing towards the center. We're going to do the same thing as we did before with the force balance. But instead of a cube, we actually need to cut out a little slice of our cylinder here and get something that looks kind of like a cube, but has some rounded edges. So I'm going to zoom into this just a little bit. For now, I want to focus on this front face and back face. There's not going to be any acceleration in the tangential direction once all of this is spun up to speed. So we can ignore the side faces. And the top and bottom face are going to work exactly the same way as the top and bottom face do in our normal constant acceleration. Now what I do need to do is go ahead and label the lengths of all of these sides. So the length of the theta direction is going to be r multiplied by delta theta. So we take this little delta theta slice out of our ring, and r is the position of the ring, Delta theta is the angle of that slice that we take out. This distance here is going to be delta z, and then the distance in the radial direction is just delta r. So if we have face 1 and face 2, like I said, we're going to ignore all the rest. The area of 1 is going to be r delta theta delta z which is also going to be equal to the area of phase 2. And basically we're making an assumption here that this delta r is a lot smaller than r, so the faces here are basically the same. Now we're going to do the same thing that we've done in the past where we just say that the pressure on one face is going to be p, and then whenever we look at the pressure on the other face, it's going to be p plus the variation, so dp dr, multiplied by the distance, which is just delta r. And the last piece of the puzzle is the definition of delta m. So delta m for this case, once again, is just the multiplication of the three sides multiplied by rho. Rho times delta r times r delta theta times delta z. So that's finally all the pieces of the puzzle that we need in order to do the force balance specifically in the r direction. So we're going to have our pressure on face 1 multiplied by the area of face 1, which I'm going to go ahead and write out as r delta theta delta z. And that's pushing in the positive r direction, so we leave that as positive. And then we subtract off the pressure plus this dp dr times delta r, and that again is going to have the same area, this r delta theta delta z. And that's going to be equal to this delta m multiplied by our acceleration in the r direction. So this is our rho delta r times r delta theta times delta z, all multiplied by a negative omega squared r. So with that all done, we can start canceling things out. So this pressure and this pressure go away, as they normally do. And then this r delta theta delta z cancels out with this r delta theta delta z. And we can go and get rid of this delta r and this delta r. So our final equation here is a negative dp dr is going to be equal to rho times omega squared r, and there's a negative sign there as well. 
So we can get rid of both of those negative signs, and we have an equation for the pressure variation in R. So we're going to use this pressure variation in R and copy from our pressure variation in Y, except we're going to be changing to the Z direction, because that's what we're using in the cylindrical coordinates. Splicing those two together, we end up with our pressure being equal to rho omega squared multiplied by r squared over 2 minus the dp dy term, but instead of the acceleration in y, we're using z, and that's going to be multiplied by z instead. And then finally, we just add our constant. So for constant rotation, with a little bit of vertical acceleration thrown in, we can come up with a pressure distribution as well.